Greetings and welcome. This is Artie from Artifact Electronics. So uh, a little earlier today I came uh, across a bag of stuff I had and uh, this was in it. It's an Entech Space Invaders handheld game from 1980 and uh, let's have a look at this, see if we can get it to do anything and uh, how much fun this is. And I know this is not as exciting as a scope or a function generator or something exotic, but uh, I haven't really found anything very interesting, so I thought I'd uh, get rid of a bit of backlog I have of the uh, slightly less interesting artifacts to show you. Here's power switch and doesn't do anything. Surprise, surprise. But it's battery powered, so uh, let's see if it even has batteries or what goes on. So let's see, there's a label on the back that gives us instructions on how to play Space Invaders. Gives us some troubleshooting that basically says if it's behaving badly, put new batteries in it. So we're probably going to follow that advice. And it's copyright. 1980 by Entex Industries, made in Taiwan, patent pending. Okay, it's battery time. Ooh. These batteries have leaked. So not only are they completely dead, most likely, but let's see what kind of corrosion they left behind. Oh, there's white flakes all over the place. And no, real men don't wear gloves when they remove leaked batteries. Yeah, they are all in pretty nasty shape on both sides. So uh, let's shake out the dirt here. Ah, looks better already, but uh, you can probably see the contact received a good amount of corrosion. First, let's get rid of the uh, core stuff. It's like all sorts of stuff coming out of here. But we all know that the AA batteries are of the uh, alkaloid type. Even says that on here alkaline battery. says it right on the battery. It says an expiration date of March 2005. They all do. But since the uh, manufacturers usually uh, put the expiration date on these things, it's about four or five years ahead of when you see them in the uh, when you see them in the store. This means these batteries were last put in in the early 2000s and uh, they gave their life. Since these are alkaline batteries, uh, probably the best way to clean them up would be plain old household vinegar. And uh, a Q-tip, or several. And let's see if we can get that corrosion off the battery terminals. Ah, the smell of fresh vinegar in the evening.
So yeah, this is going to need a little more in-depth cleaning. But in the end, it's not too bad. Most of the stuff's coming off. The uh, contacts haven't been eaten away to a point where they break apart or lose stability. So to clean the contacts, we just have to repeat what I just did a few times and get the uh, terminals nice and shiny. Okay, the vinegar did its job very well. I uh, put some on with a Q-tip and if you look at it closely, when it hits the uh, battery leakage, if it's uh, working properly, it will react and you can actually see all the white areas start to bubble. So the acid is reacting with the alkaline leakage and we get some pretty clean contacts. Use a Q-tip again to wipe off all residue and finally squirt some IPA into there and uh, turn it around and let it sit and let the IPA basically stop whatever reactions are going on there and uh, then we're done. And as a matter of fact, uh, it's probably not a bad idea to use one of these bottles and uh, to squirt the uh, vinegar on top of these. So instead of rubbing it in, you can just uh, squirt the vinegar on top and then let them sit and let the vinegar react. And then when you're happy with it, wipe it off with a Q-tip. Use some vinegar, uh, some uh, IPA to stop uh, any reactions and clean out the residue. And we should be good to go. Yeah, it cleaned up nicely, but this doesn't always happen depending on uh, how long the battery was leaking and how long they were still, uh, if it was in a moist environment or not, it will usually attack the contacts and if the contacts start breaking off, there's really not a whole lot you can do. But in this case we were lucky, so let's put some batteries in. I don't even have six of the same kind, so we're going to end up with a ragtag collection of batteries in here. But uh, I measured all these batteries, they are good. They seem kind of shorter than the other ones. Look at the loose fit. It's very interesting. And uh, finally, we'll put in the uh, Ultra Last batteries. And those fit in tightly, so these Sunbeam batteries, which are the uh, dollar store special, seem to be physically shorter just ever so slightly but well let's hope the battery door keeps things in and drum roll okay so it kinda came up it's we have an amateur and a professional here But, oh, it's, it's already playing. Alright, let me hold it in a way that you can actually see what's going on. Okay, I got a high score of two. Let me see if I can clean up the screen a little bit. And the batteries are a bit loose in here, but I'm not losing power. So yeah, let me clean up the screen a bit and see if I can get this to a point where you can actually see what's going on on the screen. Well, this angle doesn't look too bad. Okay, you got to turn it on and off. I think these buttons need some cleaning. Hey, hey. All right, let's look inside and see. The uh, fire button is a bit lazy. 
So that gives us an opportunity to have a look inside. So here's the inside. A bunch of broken posts here. Two here and another one here that the screw's still sticking in. So uh, I guess this guy's had a hard life. But uh, yeah, I removed a few screws here. And this whole board pops out. Nothing underneath. It's got the display, which has this paper overlay. And it's, it's just the diode matrix. Here are the drivers and the limiting resistors. And the seven segments are also like that, even though they show the full segments. But you can't. There's actually only one LED behind each segment. But with the diffuser, I guess uh, you can't really see that when you're playing the game. And then, of course, down to the uh, logic in here. It's got an MP1211. And uh, I guess the date code is 8119. So the 19th week of 1981. And that's all she wrote. This is an embedded processor that's pre-programmed for the game, I'm sure. And uh, that's really all there is to it. It is a through-hole part, but it's got a different uh, pitch on the pins. And then we got a bunch of uh, flex cables running to the display matrix. And that's all there is to it. So I cleaned the, the switch surfaces. Some dirt came off. I would not use uh, alcohol on these, of course. It's probably going to take the surface off, so just wipe them with a slightly damp cloth. And it's kind of interesting to look in here and see uh, that the uh, diode matrix, there's really tiny surface mount diodes soldered at the intersection of the matrix points, which of course you can't see. Let me try anyway. Down there in the holes. And that comprises the uh, display matrix. Normally they got like custom uh, fluorescent displays that have the shapes and everything on there, but over here they achieved the same effect by just making a rectangular display and uh, so the only thing custom about this is really the overlay. I guess you could put another overlay on here and play Pac-Man. Be a pretty lousy Pac-Man but uh, it's an interesting approach. Other issues uh, are the terminals on the inside. Come on. Terminals on the inside are also uh, corroded, and I'm going to clean those off. And uh, some of the uh, broken off posts you can see uh, lying here will need to be super glued back into place. This thing's had a rough life, but uh, since it does power up, Let's see if we can take care of all those issues. Also the diffuser. Somebody got angry at this and separated the glue on him. So we're going to glue this back into place too. And then we should have a perfectly good game. Okay, I did all the maintenance. Glued the posts back, cleaned the inside. I tried to clean the uh, front but uh, it scratched up pretty good. But uh, I turned off some of the lights and uh, let's see if we can actually play a game on this. Now one thing to point out is it's... Uh, I think they exhausted all of the uh, code space in here very quickly because there's really no start game. You turn it on, the game starts immediately. When you lose your lives the game's over and it shows you the score, but you can't restart the game by pressing the buttons. You have to turn it on and off. So uh, 
Yes, they they used every last nibble in this thing to make the game work. Yeah, this is kind of awkward playing it like this, but uh, let's see. Not oh, good. Oh, come on. All right, another try. Ooh. Am I good or what? Alright, Space Invaders is done. But we have a few minutes left, so uh, what do you say we have a look at something related to this that was in the same batch of stuff that I got this out from? What do you say? Yeah? Alright, you twisted my arm. Let's look at something else. All right, so what we got here is this guy, which is a Lego RCX 1.0. This was their initial release of their robotics invention system. And this is the brains. It's got a processor. It's got some uh, DC motor drivers. And... Uh, it basically works through an I, it's programmed through an IR port and uh, what you need is an IR tower that has a USB connector to hook it up to your Windows 95 machine and that's how you program it and uh, then you upload your programs to this and you just uh, put this in whatever model you have and run the program and uh, there you go there's your Lego robotics system I got a partial kit for a few dollars, missing a lot of pieces, but at least let's see if the brains still work. This thing's kind of heavy for its size, so I bet you there's batteries inside, but uh, nothing happening, so how do we open this thing? No screws. Lots of batteries. Oh, and what we can do here, we can probably just measure the batteries. Where's my meter? Measure the batteries while they're still in here. See that? No, you can't. Let's do it this way. Yeah, you can kind of see that, but probably Now nah, the batteries are dead. Now this also has a uh, external power 
support for an AC adapter and uh, I read somewhere that it takes a 9 to 12 volt uh, it takes 9 to 12 volts AC it's not very common I haven't looked yet but I'm going to look through my boxes but I think the first order is to put fresh batteries in here and see if uh, we can get it to power up so I took out the batteries and had a look at the contacts. That side looks pretty good. And at first I thought this side did too, but then if you look at the far right connector, there's some junk on it, which definitely looks like battery leakage. So let's give it the uh, vinegar and IPA treatment, and then put fresh, well not necessarily fresh, but the uh, good batteries in there and see if it'll power up. So it turns out that the uh, deposits on this contact were not uh, battery leakage. It just looks like the whole thing is kind of discolored. Looks like it's rust but I used IPA and even acetone and I couldn't really change anything. Couldn't get rid of the stuff but I think the most important part of the uh, contact is the center right here. So there's not a large contact surface, surface but rather just the edge over here that makes contact with the battery terminal. And what I did was I scraped it with an X-Acto knife because that's the only way I could get it somewhat shiny and get the uh, stuff off of it. And uh, so let's see if that uh, does us any good. So I put my ragtag collection of batteries in there. They are, I mean, they're good as far as uh, voltage. So let's have a look and see what the contacts say. And if we measure it, I think it's from here to here. Yeah, it gives us 9.3 volts, which should be more than enough. Now these two batteries are sitting tightly, but these Sunbeam batteries seem to be a little less tall than the normal ones, so they're a bit loosey-goosey in here. But uh, let me put the back cover on because that'll hold the batteries in place. And... Off we go. It works. You can select different programs. Run the program, even though I have no idea what that does. And there's a view button, which doesn't do anything. I think it's program dependent. So it's running. View doesn't do anything. But the next thing I want to look at is that this has an external AC adapter input, which uh, which is 12 requires 12 volts AC, and 12 volts AC adapter is actually 9 to 12 volts, and I didn't have one. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, take a 9 volt adapter, a DC adapter that I have such as this and rewire it to tap off the uh, AC voltage coming off of the transformer in here and uh, see if this thing will power up from the uh, AC voltage. So the magic is done. Poof! And the top comes off. Isn't that great? Now I cut it with a Dremel tool and ended up with some uh, messy margins in here. But it came off and I, I actually managed not to cut into anything inside. So what we really have in here, and this is off, we have the transformer and then uh, a full wave rectifier in here with the four diodes and a smoothing cap. And all we really got to do is uh, 
change the uh, wired connection to go directly to the transformer secondary that outputs somewhere around 9 volts. Now I didn't pay attention, one other thing I did was uh, this plug, it's too narrow to fit into the RCX, so I'm going to have to change the plug too, but I've done the majority of the work dremeling this thing open, so now let's see if we're actually getting something around 9 volts AC out of this. So let me put this over here. Turn it on. No. Oh well, it gives us 11.5 volts AC from the uh, center terminals of the secondary on the transformer. So let's uh, transfer the cables that connect to the rectified output to the secondary uh, that we need. So I just removed the entire rectifier board. Uh, which was only attached to the two secondary pins on the transformer and then soldered the output wires directly to the secondary outs and uh, we need one last test so here we go 11 and a half volts AC that's well within 9 to 12 volts. So let's put this thing back together and tape it back together and there you go. And most importantly, uh, change the label on it so I don't uh, fool myself down the line. And then we'll actually plug in the RCX and see what's happening. And here, my good friends, is the uh, beautiful result. I put things back together, gave it a professional wrap, the kind they use on cars, so it looks brand new, labeled it, at least that isn't handwritten, and of course gave it the uh, proper barrel plug at the end. This is, this is uh, no doubt the ugliest power adapter I do have, but they don't call them wall warts for nothing. So well, let's see at least if it does its job. So let's see if we can blow up this RCX here. And man, this is like, I took the batteries out. This weighs like half as much as it did before. And uh, nothing happens. Why? Because the power strip is turned off. Again. So yes, it works. stable and another repair seems to be completed so I actually got a few bits and pieces with the RCX two motors a switch and um, I think what this is it's a, a color detector and so let's see if any of these guys work. Now one thing I noticed immediately was this motor can be turned by hand and turns pretty smoothly. This one doesn't turn by hand at all. I don't know whether that's because I'm worthless and weak or uh, it is completely seized, but uh, what I thought I'd do is use some leverage and I can turn it that way, but it turns pretty rough. So let's uh, first put in the good motor into output 1. And now this depends on what kind of programs are in here. I couldn't 
find any description for them. So let's just see what happens. So if we run this, this guy starts turning and it just turns forever. If I press the switch, nothing happens. And if I plug in the uh, supposedly seized motor, it does run, but it's really, really loud. But nothing else does anything. So let's try program 2. They're both running and uh, there's little indicators on here that show the direction. Little arrows that point left and right that I guess show which way the motor is running. And it's only for A and C. B doesn't have any indicators, which probably means it's not running. There's a view button on here that doesn't do anything. button doesn't do anything. So let's go to program number three. And program number three when you hold in the switch they both start running. Let's see what is it. They both start running counterclockwise. And another interesting thing I found was if you use the uh, IR, not IR detector, but the uh, color detector, I think they call it. In this mode, it actually, the red LED lights up, and I, if I point it at the overhead light, it turns on, hmm, it turns on the right side motor. So, uh, do I have a light source? I mean, oh, there's another light source over there that I'm pointing it at. But the indicators seem to show that uh, both motors are turned on, but this one isn't doing anything. Program number four. Nope. Nope. Oh. It will help to run it. So that one just keeps switching direction on its own without any input from me. And then it shuts off and the program stops running. Okay, so this thing lights up again. It just automatically switches the motors back and forth in direction. You know, this guy stopped functioning again. Maybe it just has a huge dead spot on there. Yep. So this started running too, but I have to look into disassembling this thing. Yeah, so this is probably a test program for a bot to just run around and turn, uh, you know, the tank threads reverse directions and stuff and make it look like it's actually doing something. Program number five. Running both motors counter well, actually clockwise if looked at in this way. This doesn't do anything. Let's see if the switch does anything.
So here's the two guys we fixed. They both had uh, very similar problems. Battery leakage that caused the battery contacts to corrode. And uh, this one cleaned up really nicely, the, the, uh, the contacts. This one, they did clean up, but I could not uh, get the discoloration in one of the term battery terminals off using traditional methods but uh, I kind of scraped it clean in the middle and it does run off of batteries now of course uh, you get what you pay for and these dollar store batteries are just not tall enough they're just slightly too short to fit interestingly enough in both of these devices they kind of fit very loosely so uh, I guess if I want to run these with batteries I gotta go out and spend some real money on batteries this one we're pretty much done with. I doubt I'd be uh, spending a lot of time playing it, but this one has me kind of intrigued. Um, as I alluded to, I, I do have a partial set. It came in the original box, but uh, uh, there, are, there are many bits and pieces missing. And if I come across something else, if I can ever complete this thing, I will uh, probably do another video on this. Uh, and show you. I mean, you need a Windows 95 machine to run the software properly. And, uh, of course, uh, that software is no longer supported by uh, LEGO. But I actually, in the bits and pieces I got, I did get the uh, original CD, which is scratched up quite a bit, but uh, I did attempt to copy it to to my uh, regular machine and it worked. It was able to make a copy of the whole thing. So I do have the software. So uh, maybe I'll either run DOSBox or VirtualBox or whatever on the PC or I'll dig through my PC uh, garbage and see if I can put together a Win95 machine and have a look. The, uh, the uh, operating software is quite interesting. It's it's totally visually driven uh, drag and drop stuff where you you connect logic blocks together and uh, and I think what it does is it downloads pseudocode to this and uh, then this just executes the pseudocode taking one of three inputs and uh, affecting one or all of three outputs. Thanks for watching and uh, please support the channel give me a thumbs up if you think i deserve it and make sure to subscribe see you later